welcome to lecture 9 of uh, computational geometry and we will continue with the topic that we started last time uh, and namely you know quick hull right. So, I, I gave you an example uh, you know of this algorithm which is traditionally known as quick hull has a behavior similar to quick sort in some sense that you know you you are dividing into two sub problems you know based on uh, the points. Um, that you can discard from within the triangle. So, just a quick recap. Uh, so, you, you have this, uh, so we are only looking at let us say the upper hull. So, you have L and R the leftmost and rightmost point and the remaining points you know can be arbitrarily distributed and you find the point that is furthest from this uh, line maybe this point. Okay, look at this triangle and clearly all the points in the triangle can be eliminated. So, it is only the points that are outside the triangle you need to recurse and recursively you build the left part of the upper hull and the right part of the upper hull and then of course, pasting them is trivial. The problem with this is that uh, the two sub problems can be very skewed okay, which means that you may have a recursion of something like T's of n. Uh, equal to T's of the left right. So, the left sub problem per T's of right sub problem plus order n and if L and R are not balanced you know if L is much much larger than R then this would imply you know T's of n is about uh, you know n square kind of thing right. So, this is what uh, is the problem with the folklore quick, quick hull and there is not much hope of avoiding this behavior. Uh, in the way that we or at least not in the straightforward way that we do for quick sort where you pick the pivot at random. So, we will again do something at random okay, not I mean I mean the, the process is not random, but we will use randomization, uh, but, to, but to you know give you an the, the basic um, the crux of the idea you know how randomization is useful uh, I will actually de describe a, 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 a deterministic algorithm. Okay. Um, okay, so, the algorithm is of will have the following steps. Okay. Um, so, it may, it may not be very transparent you know the description is, is, is kind of you know have, have some mystery. So, but you know we will uh, unravel that. So, the first thing that you do is uh, you pair up points arbitrarily. So, I am not saying at random, I am saying arbitrarily any way that you want. Okay. So, if you start with n points this means that you will have about n over 2 pairs. Okay, I am avoiding the floor and ceiling. So, n over 2 let us say n is a power of 2 or something like that. So, n over 2 pairs. Okay. Now, what you do is among these n over 2 pairs find the pair say call it uh, um, okay let's call it l m r m that has the median slope right. So, of course, we are not going to compute the slopes explicitly, we will somehow figure out which pair has the median slope. So, of course, this this pairs uh, can be thought about as you know lines. So, so the look at the slopes of these n over two lines, okay, and uh, and a L M R M is the one let us say that has the median slope. Okay. Um, find the extreme 
point uh, orthogonal in the uh, in direction to lmr in okay i'll i'll draw a figure to explain what i mean by this and okay so maybe i should stop here and then we'll we'll kind of deduce the algorithm from here okay, let me shift to the to drawing a figure for this <coughs> So, we are given this uh, L r okay, and the points. Now, the points I have paired up arbitrarily. Okay, so, maybe I have one pair like this, another pair like this. I am not drawing too many of them. Okay. So, this is the way I have paired up the points arbitrarily. Right. Now, what suppose this and, and look at the slopes of all these lines. So, if you extend up their lines, you know, these, these pairs define lines and among these lines find out the line or the pair that has the median slope. Okay. Suppose it is this one. Suppose it is this one. This is the one that I have the median slope. Okay. And then, what I mean by find the extreme point orthogonal to this is you move in the direction, okay, in this direction, or you can think about essentially uh, moving, you know, tr you know, sort of uh, translating this, uh, this in this direction. The, the you you move in this direction and look at the point that this line. Uh, the last point that this line is going to intersect. Okay, so then it happens in this case. It's probably this point. So that is the extreme point orthogonal to the direction of this slope. Okay. So this is the point that let's call this some p of m. So this is the extreme point in the direction orthogonal to this line. Okay. okay. So this will, with this, we will define. Uh, the following triangle. Okay, so first of all, you draw a line perpendicular to this. Okay, so this point is will define the apex of the triangle, and look at this triangle. Now, the difference between the folklore quick hull and this one is that I have chosen p's of p sub m in a certain manner. It is not simply the point that is furthest from this line. Okay. It, it depends on what the median slope is and I have chosen the extreme point orthogonal to the direction. All right. And of course, the same thing would apply that all the points within the triangle can never be an extreme point or a corner point. So, we can of course, discard all that. That is the way the the folklore quick works. Okay. Here also we can discard those points, but my arguments will not use it at all because we really do not know how many points will be discarded, maybe none will be discarded. So, I am not going to use that argument at all while analyzing this algorithm. We will use completely separate arguments, but you know over and beyond what we are going to discard, uh, we can also discard these points within the triangle. So, if you actually implement the algorithm, you would actually discard the points within the triangle also. So, there is why would the point p m be on the hull? So, any extreme point in any direction will be a corner point, right? It is like you know just rotating the axis. So, I have what have I done? I have simply I am just saying that uh, you know in this direction, in this direction, if I ro rotate the axis on this direction, p m becomes an extreme point. So, by the same uh, logic that you know the leftmost or the rightmost point is extreme, this is also extreme. In whatever direction you go, 
you know, uh, the 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 it's, it's basically a tangent. It defines a tangent, right? So you can pass a line through it so that all the other points will be on one direction. Um, maybe we'll come back to that later. I mean, it should be simple enough, I believe. You know, so if you just draw a line, you know, from the point you draw the line, and you s can from the intersection of with the triangle, you should be able to figure out whether it's inside or outside. How many times are going to intersect? Yeah, that's a general kind of a way of figuring out if the point is inside the polygon. So triangle is a very special case of a convex polygon. Though, so that should be easiest. I guess what you are asking me here is that. Uh, can we figure out you know whether it's a convex linear combination i don't even need to do all that i don't need to solve any linear equations i can simply just you know given a triangle i can i can traverse start you know just draw a line along any direction and if it intersects once then it is inside if it intersects twice then it is outside that that's that's the easiest way to do it okay so i have this triangle but what is this triangle buying us not much actually i would actually focus on something else <laughs> Um, so, I d of course, I do not know what the convex hull is, but what I know is uh, the convex, the part of the convex hull to the left of this point P m okay, will look something like this. Okay, and the part of the convex hull to the right of P m will look something like this. What I am actually trying to draw your attention to, this is not such a nice figure, is this is my this is the slope of the tangent passing through PM. Okay. Now, if you look at the edges of the convex hull to the left of PM, okay, they are actually all ordered by slopes. Okay. So this one has a certain angle. Okay, so let me just enlarge this. So there is one edge and then it turns and you know there is it is a monotonically sort of decreasing angle for the edges right and eventually you hit this uh, this tangent so you are actually kind of rotating like this right so the angles are if you look at it counterclockwise the angles are decreasing right so in fact that's that's also a useful observational property about convex hulls or particularly about upper hulls where the angles from the left to right you know are kind of decreasing okay. um, so the so if you look at the left of pm at this point pm okay and this this line let us say let's call it l okay the line l has a certain slope so all the slopes to the left of l okay slopes left of l of the edges of convex hull are greater right and slopes to the right are smaller okay. now you look at any segment so any pair so Look at a pair like this. Okay, I will distinguish between a few kinds of. So this pair has the two endpoints on the two side of this vertical line that I have drawn from PM. Okay, so this is one kind of a pair where. Uh, so I am going to somehow recurse again on the left and right hand side. Okay. Now for a for for a pair like this, one point is to the left of this vertical line. The other point is to the right of this vertical line. Okay, so these pairs we will call these are good pairs. Okay, so this is a good pair. You know, which essentially it means that you know the, the two points are split between the the two the two sub problems that we'll define. I haven't even quite formally defined the sub problem. The sub problems will be the part of the convex hull to the left of PM and the part of the convex hull to the right of PM. Okay, so these two points, okay, they are splitting up one in each. Okay. We will actually try to control the size of the sub problems okay, to the left and right of this vertical line. So now if you look at let us say a, um, a pair like this, okay. suppose I am looking at this pair, then what can you claim about this pair? 
these are the two end points, what can you claim about this pair? So this, well it does not look like that, but if I draw, let us say I take these three, uh, let me label them, let us call it um, um, P1, P2 and Pm. So if I look at this triple, Pm, P2, P1, P2 is the point that is closer to the vertical line, all right. Pm is the point that is closer to the vertical line. I, it is not Pm, P1, P2, it will be Pm, P2, P1. Okay, so I am looking in, in this order, P m, P 2, P 1 and what kind of turn is it making at P 2? No, I mean it is along this, yeah. So it is making a right turn and can you deduce anything on the basis of this? P 2 cannot be because P 2 you should be able to express as a convex linear combination of something. So, P2 cannot be a point on the on the convex hull on the, or it cannot be essentially a corner point or an extreme point, right. So, what is special about this P1, P2? I mean if you fine, you know some, you know if I have a right turn, I will discard one of these points, but I may not have any right turns, I may have all left turns, right. Okay, let us look at this situation. So, this is the slope of, so this is the L, so this is the, this is the slope L, okay. Now, I claim that to the to the right in the right to the left of this uh, vertical line okay any pair that has a slope less than pm okay any pair that has a slope less than pm even if you think about a slope equal to l sorry not slope of pm sorry the, the slope of l so if there is any pair in the left half okay which has even a slope equal to l okay then this PM, this and this point that will make a right turn. Okay. So, okay, maybe I should blow it up. Okay, let me try to blow it up again. Let me take another page. So, so all I am saying is so I have some kind of a triangle I have defined. And this is the vertical line. Okay. Here is my L which is which came from the median and the any any line any any pair okay any pair which has slope less than this okay and to the left half okay will necessarily be a right turn the median slope right so L was obtained from the median slope of among all the n over 2 pairs, right. So this is the slope, okay, and I am claiming that anything that has slope less than this on the left hand side, okay, if it has slope more than this, if it is like this, okay, I cannot say much because this may or may not be a, uh, this, this may or may not be a uh, left turn, but anything that has slope less than L on the right hand side, any pair, so the both the points of the pair lie to the left hand side. If the pairs are split up, I do not even argue anything about that. If the if the pair lies to the left of this vertical line and has a slope less than L, okay. So uh, any pair that uh, has slope less than L and is to the left of the vertical at p m okay. I can I mean you can observe you can actually even prove if you want but you know you can see it right right here that the uh, the um, uh, triple this is p one this is p two the triple p m p one P2 will be a right turn and hence P1 can be discarded. And you can make an analogous observation about the right half, slopes um, 
greater and to the right. Again, you can discard one point. So, what is this actually giving us? Okay, so, we are really aiming for the following. We are aiming for a kind of an even split or almost even split. Okay. If the two points are on two sides, we do not care, we will call it recursively uh, on those uh, on those points, the left and the right sub problem, because each point ha will contribute one to the left and one to the right. We are bothered about those pairs okay, that lie to one side of the vertical line. Okay. So, from this observation that we just made, okay, the question is what, so if, if uh, uh, if we call the algorithm recursively on left right of uh, okay the the division is really this this vertical line okay of the vertical at pm what is the maximum number of points in a sub problem. So, that is the question that we ask. So, what do you think it is based on this observation? Uh, not n over 2, n over 2 would be great, you know, that means exactly even split. What have we argued? There are, see, n over two. By the way, let me let me ask. So, n over two essentially means that, see, those pairs whose points get evenly split, you know, we have no issues with that. Okay. So, let us only think about those pairs, okay, which lie completely to one side of the vertical line. And here, let us say we let us argue about the left half. The same argument applies to the right half. So, what is the maximum number of pairs that can be to the left half? There are n over 2 pairs. Okay. Can all the n over 2 pairs be on the left half? And uh, if the all the n over 2 pairs are on the left half, what does it mean? Right. So, there is something about the median here. Suppose all the n over 2 pairs are to the left. What does it mean? So, n over 4 of them. So, now we, uh, we know that. So, th we have chosen the median of n over 2 pairs right so which means that there are n over 4 pairs uh, uh, smaller than median uh, sorry smaller in slope okay and n over 4 pairs larger in slope right now if it so someone says that all the n over 2 pairs are to the left half on the left half what is what does it mean so at least half of them have slopes smaller than the than the line l and therefore one point among those pairs can be discarded so what is the maximum number of points in the left half three quarters, three quarters right it can be n over 2 of the ones whose slopes are uh, are are larger of which we cannot argue maybe they also may define a left uh, right hand right turn it may be the slope may be larger and still may be a right turn okay so the slope may be larger the slope may be larger than pm okay but it still may be a right turn see there is still a right turn but the slope is larger than pm it depends on where that pair is but certainly n over 4 of them okay among n over 4 of them we should be able to discard one point because the, the those slopes are are smaller so at least one point among those will can be discarded so that means the maximum sub problem size okay is no more than 3n by 4 okay so this is the main observation so so answer to this question okay is 3n by 4 so remember this yeah okay so uh, there are some uh, so there are some pairs that are evenly split up okay so maybe there are k of them k are evenly split up 
So, out of the k we have only, so if there are k pairs evenly split up, okay, then we have n over 2 minus k pairs okay, that can be on one side completely. right? So, among the n over 2 minus k, okay, you should be able to discard at least one point out of the n over 4 pairs. Right? So, this plus n over 2 is the number of points on one side. Right? And the maximum value of this is 3 n by 4. So, that is what the median slope is buying us. It is making sure that uh, it cannot be too many, too much more than the n over, there are n over 4 pairs, but any anything more than n over 4 pairs, half of them will be gone. I mean half of those, those points will be gone. So, it is, it is, so the important thing is that that is a constant fraction. 3 over 4 is still a constant fraction of n. So, it is not that n minus 1 points can be here and 1 point can be there. The, the real bad behavior of quick sort if you recall was that you know when n over 1 points are there or almost n points are there and the remaining are here. So, this does a good job of splitting the problem. Right. So, let us continue with the description of the algorithm. So, so we were we, we, we said that find the extreme point orthogonal in the direction to L m R m you know call it p of p sub m. Okay. draw a vertical line through piece of m okay and use it to subdivide the problem okay so, we will use it to subdivide the problem and then we are going, going to do some pruning, right? And now prune the points on the basis of the following test. Okay. In the left sub problem, consider a pair p 1, p 2, p 2 is closer to the vertical line. If p sub m, p sub 2, p sub 1 is a right turn, then we can discard p 2 okay? and likewise for the right sub problem. Okay. This is my pruning strategy and that is it. So, I call you know then if I Call the algorithm recursively on the left and right subset of that is all. When do we stop? when basically the sub problem is empty right so you find one point of course you can always find one point if you find one point that will be the extreme point and there may not no no other point will survive there okay so that will be the limiting case so if we had there's no point outside the triangle we are done so we will certainly discover at least one output point provided it's a non trivial problem so if uh, there are you know, so we'll call it recursively only when there are some output points. <coughs> 
the observation that we have made till now is the important thing is no problem, no sub problem has size greater than 3 over 4 n. So, I could possibly try to write a recurrence and this would give me a reasonable result, right? Because I am kind of dividing the problem into two halves where no fraction is more than 3 over 4, and even if it is not n over 2, you can still show that you know it will be about n log n. But I am more ambitious, okay. I am not giving up on the, the output sensitive part of it because we are kind of looking at the output points and, and doing this divide and conquer. Right? So let let us try to write, so let us try to analyze not only with respect to uh, input size, but also with respect to the output size. Right. In any other case, it is only less than 3 over 4 n, right? So, but, but, but the bound, if we get uh, n log n bound, mm -hmm. so that would be a loose bound because, uh, because this does not append both. No, it is a loose bound uh, for sure, but then you know uh, you, we kind of know that you know uh, it cannot be better than n log n anyway. If you are not considering the output size, you are not taking it into consideration. Then you know, uh, in the worst case, you know, convex hull according to the lower bound we proved is n n log n anyways. So we don't need to look for any final analysis of this. Right? But the analysis that we will try to attempt is, you know, we will 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 parameterize not only the input set but also the outputs output size. Okay, and if you recall, we had looked at something similar when we are discussing the maximal point set, right? So so now let me write this in terms of input and output so t of n comma h okay the number of input points and output points number of input points what have we done we we are saying that this running time is less than t of the left half, the points in the left half, the output points in the left half plus t of the points in the right half okay, plus the output points in the right half. Uh, so, we can write it as h minus h l minus 1 because one point we have detected already. Okay. Plus, how much work have we done in doing all these things? We have done what? We have let's let's go back. Let's go back to the algorithm. Pair of the points, trivial, order n, right? Among the n over two, find the pair that has a median slope. Okay, now it's a median slope, but then you can use somehow some kind of again left hand right hand test to you know to do this you know it's a, how 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 quickly can you find the median of a set of points n points order n time right so i am claiming that with just a slight modification of that where the tests individual tests are not you know less than greater than we are not going to compute the slope but again in terms of some left hand right hand tests we can again find this median in order n time so so this is order n this is order n. In fact, this is not even order n. I mean, this n over 2 pairs can be just looking at the first and second point, third and fourth point. So, it is basically cos 0 actually, the step 1. But let me just write down order n. Finding median is order n. Find the extreme point orthogonal to the direction. How much will this be? But how would you implement If you write a program, how would you implement this? order n because you know you can think about just rotating the axis and finding the extreme point again it is some extreme computation. Okay. So, all that again everything you know this is also order n. 
So we have only done order and time. Uh, we have only spent order and time in the first three steps. Now we want to do this pruning. What does pruning imply? Again, I am looking at every pair only once. There are only n over two pairs. Okay. So again, order n, and we call the algorithm recursively. Okay, that's all. The recursive cost is covered here. So overall, then I can claim that you know this is the kind of work that I need to do. Right. For the terminating case, let us say T n comma 1, there will be at least one output point otherwise it cannot be, I mean a convex hull must have at least one output, the, the, even the upper hull. Okay. So, that is let us say some, let me put down a constant, it is order n, but let me put down a concrete constant, let us say c through 1 times n. So, this is my reference. And last time when we are dealing with uh, maximal points, I did not solve this recurrence um, and I just claimed that, okay, so we have some nice thing about this N L and uh, H uh, N R, right. What we, what we know is N L comma N R, what can we say about them? Both are less than 3 over 4 N. Okay. So, so this is the one crucial thing that we will require to get a bound on this on this recurrence. So let me just quickly work through the recurrence. I could have left it as an exercise, but I thought that let me just go ahead and do it. Um, so. Uh, so, let me write this as T of n comma h let me write a no some concrete constant c times n. Okay. We know there is a base case. Okay. I am not going to write that. Um, so, I am claiming that the solution claim solution is the form n log of h. So, why is this claim true? We don't prove by induction. So, someone may have objection to this n log h saying that if h is 1, this is 0 and those everything becomes 0. right? So, uh, I will be a little sloppy uh, and I claim that uh, you can say this is uh, order n log h for h strictly greater than 1. Okay. For h equal to 1, it is order n anyways. Okay. So, so, proof by induction basically says that I am going to plug in this solution to the right hand side and verify. Right. So, plug in. Now, this solution means, you know, I cannot use a big O notation. I must have again some kind of concrete constant. So, let us say it is equal to k times n log 2 of h for some constant k solution and verify. Because uh, both the sub problems are strictly smaller than the original sub problem. So, by induction, you know, this is a valid proof by induction. So then, what do we do? So, so we get T of n L H L equal to K n L log two of H L T of n R H L. So 
So, I will be again a little sloppy instead of writing H L, I will just write I could have written I should have written H minus 1 minus H L, but I will just to keep notation simple I just write H minus H L. If anything I will I am going to only, this is only going to be you know sort of you know I am only giving uh, uh, making it worse actually in the in the sense that you know I, am, I could have taken out 1 from here. Okay. So, the total cost of the right hand side, so right hand side is k times, now n l, uh, sorry, I am sorry, I am sorry, I should not write n l. So, uh, the total right hand side cost is basically then k times um, n l log h r plus n um, r plus c times n. Now, if you look at this thing um, carefully, uh, the real battle will be that we have this additive term c times n, you know that somehow should get subsumed. Okay. So, we will we'll see that. <coughs> so, since uh, n sub i is less than 3 over 4 n, um, so we can write this the whole thing becomes um, k times n. So, we want to actually maximize the right hand side because that is the worst case. Okay. So, to maximize of course, there is a plus C n term. To maximize the R H S, okay, you can differentiate basically you know with respect to essentially H L is what we want to differentiate with. Okay. H L, okay. So I won't. I have done the job for you. So I said I'll only just mention what it is. So just do it, and it turns out that uh, H L, uh, it is, it is obtained when H L equal to alpha times H. In other words, whatever is the maximum value of alpha, so alpha is less than 3 over 4. So, only when you have basically have all the output points loaded to one side that will give you the maximum. That actually is quite consistent with the behavior of these functions. And so, then what happens is if you just look at the this part, this part, okay. So, the maximum value of that is uh, uh, we just substitute that. So, uh, alpha log alpha h plus 1 minus alpha log 1 minus alpha. So, this is you know so it is alpha times something plus 1 minus alpha times something and assuming that you know alpha takes the maximum value 3 over 4. So, and 1 minus alpha will be smaller than that. So, the whole thing should be less than log of alpha h okay, which is equal to. Uh, so, alpha is less than 3 4 right. So, that is log of h minus log of 4 over 3. Okay. So, this is basically the advantage that you are going to get because this is the minus term. Okay. So, if you look at this expression, 
So, I am this this is this is only for this expression. Okay. We have additive C n term, we have k n multiplied by that. Okay. So, you are going to multiply k n by this whole thing. So, you are going to get k n times log of h minus log of 4 over 3 okay, and plus there is a C n term. Okay. So, the minus is very important because otherwise it will be k n log h which is the left hand side. So, and you, you have to somehow neutralize this quantity and that is neutralized essentially by this lo minus log 4 over 3. This is a fraction, right? log of 4 over 3 to the base 2 is a fraction. right? So, we have to essentially then means that we have to choose. So, this is true. So, uh, so this whole thing okay, should be less than k n log h that is what our inductive assumption was. And this is true only if you choose a large enough k that is all. Right. So, it implies that k is larger than or equal to c over log of 4 over 3. So, that is a fraction. So, as long as it, k is larger than this quantity, this whole thing goes through. Right. So, it is some constant larger than that. As long as it is larger than that, then it means that the solution is because the induction proof goes through, which means that the solution is order n log h k is a constant. Okay, as long as you choose k constant larger than c over this, the induction proof goes through. So, this is the reason I went through this without asking you to do it at home is this you know this kind of proof technique you know we we use uh, very generously when uh, we are dealing with complicated recurrences. You know computer science all said and done you know it only de deals with recurrence like you know 2 n over 2 plus order n. Okay. Uh, or uh, t's of n equal to t's of n minus 1 plus order n. You know, these are the kind of standard recurrences that algorithm books talk about. And then there in the exercises, we'll, you'll find these more complicated looking recurrences and you wonder, you know, why the hell are we studying that. Okay. So, you do come across many complicated recurrences when you are, you know, you know designing, uh, you know, at least you have a new idea for designing an algorithm, divide and conquer is a, is a very useful strategy and it is not necessary that in the divide and conquer, you will always get t's of n equal to 2 t's of n over 2 plus order n. You, know. you can get, you know, this is a fairly complicated recurrence, you know, it is a two dimensional recurrence. Okay. It is a two dimensional recurrence means it is a recurrence in two variables. Okay. And if you have not seen this before, you would not have any idea of what this is. Okay. So, the first person who solved this recurrence or came up with this recurrence okay, would not have had much idea and will basically have to try all kinds of things, but eventually you will have to guess and verify. Most complicated recurrences, you know, there are no real. What should I say? There are no, uh, uh, you know, solutions from. You know, uh, there, there, there is no uh, technique for solving them other than essentially guessing and verifying. Right. Okay. So this is then uh, the my, like the final result is that that uh, Wickhall, the way we described. Okay runs in so let's call it the modified quick hull just to distinguish it from the from the uh, from the classical you know what that triangles and all the points in the triangle runs in order n log h time okay. so not only have we redressed the problem of the order n square we have actually ended up getting a bound which i promised last time that yes there are algorithms that can get you n log h. Right. Now, I will just make one change in the algorithm. Okay. This is not really like quick sort. You know, what would be quick sort? Uh, this kind of quick sort basically means I choose a median okay, and then uh, do the partitioning and of course, then I have a nice recurrence for quick sort which says t's of n equal to 2 t's of n over 2 plus order n when you are actually doing quick sort. Right. But we do not do, we do not find a median in quick sort. Can you tell me why? We do not try to find the median when we are running quick sort, we find a random element. Yeah, right. So, the finding the median that although, although there is a linear time median finding algorithm, you know, it is a fairly complicated algorithm. Okay, you do not want to go ahead and implement that, you know, it's, it requires some kind of space management, you know, there are some high constants. So, you do not want to do that, you actually want to just take the simplest uh, version of it that is, you know, find a random element, use it as a splitter and go on. But then what happens is that your analysis okay, is not that kind of deterministic analysis. Your analysis then you have to 
probably you ha you, ha you don't even encounter these analysis in, in, in the first course in algorithms. It's kind of told to you that the expected running time. So, what is what is known to us is if we choose a splitter at random, the running time of quick sort is expected order n log n. Okay, this is the kind of result you are told and there is the proof of this is not very simple. Okay, it requires you know it is not very hard, but you know it requires some careful reasoning. Okay, it is it is not an average case bound, it is not averaged over the set of inputs. You know, it is for any input this is the running time. You know, because it is only it is it is the only random randomized step you are using is the choice of the splitter and that the algorithm is controlling, you know, it is not anyone else. So, to make this a true quick hull, okay, we should not be finding medians. Then what, what is the obvious thing to do? You pair them up, that is fine. Okay. So, going back to our description of the algorithm, among the, so this median slope okay, will just be substituted with pick a random pair. Okay. Among the pairs that you have created, just pick a random pair. Now, once you do that, well, it is a uh, so it follows that so similar result follows for quick hull, i.e., expected order n log h, it remains n log h, okay, n log h. But the analysis again is much more complicated than this. Uh, if you are interested, you know I have this paper. So I'll just give you. A sp so this somehow this algorithm is not very well known in the community, not yet. Although this algorithm, this the version that I presented, okay. So the deterministic version is due to this paper by Chan Snow Inc. <coughs> Yap, okay the deterministic version. Okay. Uh, so, and it goes back to something like 1995 or 1996, let us say 1995. So, it is not that new, it is 15 years old, but somehow most people do not seem to be aware of it. They still use that, you know, they, in, in, in many places I have seen the literature, they are referring to quick hull as, you know, the triangle which does not have an analysis, proper analysis, it is an order n square algorithm in the worst case. Okay. And the randomized version where I am saying that, you know, the analysis is a lot more uh, non trivial okay so that is available in this paper so i don't know if does it come up here let's see yeah so this is a paper by uh, so that paper you know we discovered the algorithm almost simultaneously uh, so this is also around 1997 1996 whatever around 1996 i think okay. so you can so this paper is available on my website if you are interested in the analysis of the randomized algorithm you can look it up so, I will stop here and uh, next time I will continue with the next week also I will continue with, with convex hulls. So, I have done the algorithm part of the convex hulls, you know there are many more other algorithms. So, I will pick up maybe one or two more to illustrate certain other points, not about the algorithm per se. We have the n log h algorithm now. Okay. So, there is nothing more to it and this is probably the, the best and the fastest algorithm if you implement it. But, you know there are other uh, aspects of you know convex hulls that I want to you know as as an illustration of some some ideas that I want to still continue with convex hulls next week, including lower bounds. Okay.